Good morning and welcome, everyone. Let's all stand this morning as we begin our service with, uh, with praising our Lord in song, for he deserves it. So come praise and glorify.
turn together with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4 uh, for our scripture reading this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll be reading uh, verse 1 through 16. Uh, But in light of that last song that we just sang together, let me begin in chapter 3, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 says, Now to God, who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, and being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit just as also you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, namely Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Uh, Let us pray together. Uh, Father, we do uh, desire uh, you to receive all the glory uh, in your son, Jesus Christ, and in uh, the church uh, that he has purchased, and even in this church. uh, We desire you uh, to receive all uh, the fame and adoration and praise for what you have planned and done. We rejoice in our calling that you have taken all of your gathered people here and all their differences and their different personalities and ages and life experience and color and every other way. You've taken us all and you made us one. In the one Messiah you've provided by the one spirit who indwells us all You have done it. We are now your workmanship. And you haven't left us at that. You're growing us in those works that you prepared before the foundation of the world. Not only that, Christ, you have given gifts to the church in many different ways. In this passage, particularly pastors and teachers who equip the saints, and the saints are even gifts themselves to work together to build up the body of Christ. We thank you. Uh, for those gifts, and we pray that you continue to uh, bless the ministry of all those who minister the Word of God here, and both to adults and even right now as we speak uh, to the children and even the nursery. Thank you for saints who serve, who desire Christ to uh, continue to 
for your people to be built up in you. And Father, we pray for the equipping ministry. Today, equipping classes are beginning again. And we pray that you would use all this. Surely there are people here this morning who are being tossed to and fro by all the different ideas and perhaps doctrines that are out there. And we want to equip them to be steadfast on the rock of our Lord and Jesus Christ. May you continue to build up this body. May your people continue to grow in courage to speak the truth to one another with the love that you have put in all of us. May you continue to receive glory as you transform all of your children uh, to look like you are Father. And we'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Take a moment and greet one another this morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to City Bible Church. Please take your seats. Uh, it's so good to hear so many lively, energetic people this morning. Um, this is your first time here. I just want to welcome you to our church. Uh, thank you for coming out and deciding to worship uh, with us this morning. Uh, and I just want to speak just briefly into your experience potentially so far. I know there's a lot of people and you're looking around and you're probably thinking to yourself, you know, I don't know anyone here and I just sit around introducing myself to three or four people, and, uh, and you're sitting down right now probably thinking to yourself, I, I don't remember their names. Uh, and that could be a problem because in about 50 minutes, you're gonna have to stand back up. Uh, you're gonna have to maybe look, make eye contact with them, and uh, it's gonna be a bit of an awkward moment. Uh, but, but this is my pass to you this morning. I just wanna let you know that that's okay. Uh, if that's you this morning, uh, feel free, turn back around after service, reintroduce yourself to that person, get to know their name, shake their hand, give them a hug, whatever it takes uh, for you to feel like you know someone this morning. Um, and I just want you to know many of us can relate with that because that's probably all of our experiences uh, at some point at this church. Uh, and yeah, just, uh, just by way of um, reminder, if, uh, if this is your first time here and you uh, want to get to know someone and you don't know how, there's a welcome card just in front of you in the seat uh, right in front of you that you can fill out and drop off in the offering basket as it comes around uh, during the time of offering. But if that's not your speed and you just want to talk to someone, but you also don't want to uh, run into the awkward scenario of what's your name again, uh, there's a welcome table out front that you can uh, go and say hi to some friendly, friendly people who are more than happy to introduce yourself, introduce themselves to you uh, multiple times if needed. Uh, and they have a gift for you there as well. So if this is your first time, we'd love for you uh, to, to, to find the welcome table uh, to receive your gift and get to know someone at our church. Um, but if you're a regular tender, we have just three announcements for you this morning. Uh, the first of which is our men's ministry. Uh, our men's ministry is starting back up this Saturday at 8 a.m., and the, the theme that our men's ministry has decided on for this quarter is Vulnerable Strength. What an interesting title, Vulnerable Strength. Um, if you're curious about what that entails or what that means, I encourage you to come out uh, this morning at 8 a.m., uh, this Saturday morning at 8 a.m. to figure out uh, what exactly we're going to be talking about. But just to kind of get your interests going, uh, our series is about men and emotions. I know that's kind of a strange combination. Us as men, we don't like talking about our feelings, uh, but this is a time for us to get real. It's going to be a time for you to engage in thoughtful, genuine discussion with your brothers about how to process your emotions biblically, how to think through 
uh, your feelings as a man uh, and how to encourage other men who might be feeling uh, similar feelings as well. And so uh, come on out this, this Saturday at 8 a.m. and we'll have uh, some of our pastors speaking and potentially uh, I've heard there may be some guest speakers as well in following uh, weeks as well. So come on out this Saturday, 8 a.m. Please register so the food team knows how much to prepare uh, for food. Uh, the second announcement is our VBS. Uh, VBS, this is our first church VBS. How many of you have served in a VBS before? Hands in the air. So you guys are the most equipped people to help serve for this VBS. And uh, there's an email that went out last week. Uh, it might have ended up in your inbox or your spam. So please check your emails uh, for more information if you want to serve at our church's first VBS. I believe it's the first or second week of July, uh, but there will be more details to follow. So please sign up uh, if you're interested at all. Uh, please check your emails for more information. Um, and our last announcement is equipping classes. Uh, just as Pastor Ben prayed, uh, we have our equipping classes starting up today at 1 p.m., uh, and this is just a really practical way that our pastors have decided uh, of what it will look like to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so uh, how many of you are registered for an equipping class? Just, just by way of, awesome. Well, there's many of you signed up. And so hopefully if you're not signed up and you have the time today at 1 p.m., uh, I'd love for you to, to check the church center app after service ends, register for an equipping class. Uh, there's one on Old Testament survey. There's one on marriage uh, there's one on Christology and hermeneutics, and there's one mysteriously named Top Gun. So if you're interested and you're curious as to what that entails, uh, you're going to have to sign up to find out. So please sign up. And also, if you want uh, a meal voucher by our lovely food team, uh, they work diligently each week to prepare meals for us, uh, please register today. Today is the last day to register for a meal voucher. Please register uh, please be equipped. Please sign up for the equipping classes. Um, and with that, I'm going to invite the ushers up for the offering. Uh, I'll pray, and we'll continue with our worship service this morning. Pray with me. Father, as we've uh, just sung, as we've uh, just boasted in the glories of Christ and the hope uh, that we have in him, uh, we ask, Lord, that that would be the forefront uh, of our thoughts this morning. Uh, Father, as we prepare to worship you through our giving, would you remind us that all that we have, uh, you've given to us first, uh, that nothing we have uh, comes from our own efforts or our own uh, ability, uh, but solely by uh, your grace. Uh, and so, Father, as we give, uh, as we give back to you, would you incline our hearts to do so uh, out of a spirit of gratitude, um, not being forced or not uh, under compulsion, uh, but solely because, Lord, we recognize that you've given us all things in Christ. And so, Father, would you uh, glorify yourself this morning through our giving? Uh, would you exalt your Son? Uh, would you make much of him as we continue uh, to praise his name this morning? We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we continue to worship. There is one gospel on which I stand for all eternity. And it is my Father's plan, so much worship. Sun has 
City Bible Church. How are you guys doing today? As you can see, I am not Pastor Vlad. <laughs> Nevertheless, we want to accomplish the same thing, and that is to preach the Word of God to you, and I'm thankful for the opportunity. If you can, please turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. And today... We're going to read verses 1 through 5. That's Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. And let me just go ahead and open us up in prayer before we begin. Father in heaven, God, it's so appropriate, the song that we were just singing, How Great You Are. Father, you are beyond our thinking. You are beyond our imagination. You are God. Father, I pray as we look into your word, as we ponder the things of Christ, that we will be floored and that our hearts would bow in worship to you because you are truly great. And Father, as we think about the greatness of Christ, the immensity of Christ, God, that we would desire even more to be faithful and obedient to your call. 
God help me, Lord, the study that I have done, and I pray, Lord, that you would empower your word as it is communicated, but Lord, we also pray for the receptivity of your word, that your word would take root, that it would grow, and that, God, it would be a witness and testimony to those who we come into contact with, Lord. And Father, I pray for this church that we would be salt and light, and that Christ, and that Christ alone would be glorified. God, we bless you and thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Galatians 6, 1 through 5, and the word reads, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. I have titled this a bodybuilding community. And no, we're not talking about pumping iron and working out. No, we're not talking about sculpting our bodies or being chiseled. Rather, we're talking about the community of the church. That is the body of Christ and how we are to function. We are to be a church that builds one another up. You might not understand this, but the church is God's means of grace for the perseverance of the saints until we reach glory. You see, the church is not made of perfect men and women. No, the church has been correctly characterized and called a hospital. You see, the church is filled with people who still sin, are discouraged, and disheartened. Nevertheless, it is the church that is called to be the pillar in the ground of the truth. The church is the means of calling sinful men and women to faith in Christ Jesus, calling the world to repent. You see, the church is God's method to reach the world, but too often people in the church become an obstacle to faith. Two ways people in the church can become an obstacle is legalism and antinomianism. That is, living like a modern-day Pharisee or living a lawless life. You see, the Pharisee or the legalist is one who thinks they are justified by their own works of righteousness. They place burdens on people and call people to a standard that is not Biblical. These are people who are known as the Holy Joes or the pious polys. On the other hand, there are those who are without the law. They live in licentiousness and according to their own desires. They say things like, I am simply saved by grace and I can live any way that I please. You see, these are those who abuse grace as if God saved them for themselves to live any way that they like to. You see, these are extremes, and both are wrong. You see, the book of Galatians addresses both of these extremes. It is a defense or apologetic for justification by faith alone, but it clearly communicates that life must be lived according to the Holy Spirit. That is, that Christians are to keep in step or to walk with the Spirit. You see, Christians are not left alone. You see, we as Christians, we are not orphans because we have been given the spirit of power. But even more, God has given us community for accountability and encouragement. You see, in Galatians 6, 1 through 5, there are two instructions you must follow to participate in the building up of the body of Christ. There are two things that we are to aspire to in community. 
Number one, we are to be a revitalizing community. And secondly, you are to be a reflective Christian. A reflective Christian. Look at me, look with me at verse one. He says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. You see, the idea of being a revitalizing community is a community that brings life into people. It encourages people. It encourages them to want to do the very things that God has asked them. It's like helium going into a balloon that causes it to rise. And our words are to do such and have such an effect that when we speak into one another's lives, that it encourages us to rise up to keep on that faithful walk. And Paul here says... If any one or any brother is caught in any transgression, this word caught means to be caught or surprised. Notice that it is a passive voice. It's not something that I do. It is like a bird that has been caught in a trap. This is a Christian that sin has overtaken him, and now he's burdened and he's caught down, and he doesn't feel how he doesn't know how to get up. He is caught. In sin. And you'll also notice here it says that he is caught in any transgression. This word transgression literally means false step or to walk falsely or not to keep in step with the Lord. Now, this doesn't mean that we as Christians that we're not accountable before God because we absolutely are. It is sin. It is an acknowledgement that we have transgressed or trespassed against the Lord. It's very similar to us seeing a sign that says no trespassing. But yet we decide that we want to continue to go. And once we are caught, we have to pay the penalty. How much more than when we trespass against a holy and a just and a righteous God that we are to pay the penalty for the sin that we have transgressed against him. But because of Christ, we are able to thank God because he made a way by sending his son to die on our behalf. Now, when I look at this text of someone who was called in any any transgression, how does something like that happen? And there are several reasons for this. One, it could be isolation. It could be pride. It could be not being informed with the word ignorance unbiblical Christian community, and a number of other things. We're going to talk more about how we're caught. But the idea here is that this particular man or woman, someone of faith, a Christian, they're caught in sin. And he says that right here, you are to restore. Notice, look with me. He says, you who are spiritual, and that word you, that verb, or to restore, it's also a plural. It's another way of saying, y'all, you all are to restore. So we see a community aspect here. All of us are to have a role or to play a role in building up and encouraging and restoring a brother who is caught in sin. Now also when it talks about restore, there's this picture that we have of mending a, a fishing net. It has a hole in it. But it's to take this fishing net that was supposed to catch a lot of fish, and because of the hole, you are to mend it up. You are to restore it. That way it would be useful to catch more fish. Similarly, when we are caught in sin, a brother or a sister is to come alongside us and mend, restore. That way we're going to be purposeful to continue in the race that God has called us to. But who are those who are to restore He says, you who are spiritual. Who are the spiritual people? Those are the people who have been saved by grace. These are men and women who understand the doctrine of salvation. That Jesus came and lived a life that I could never live. Died a death that I should have died. And rose proving himself to be the son of God. And because of his resurrection also allows me to be born again in Christ. Those who are spiritual are those who have been affected by the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
But even more, when we're talking about those who are spiritual, these are also the ones who stand on the gospel. What I mean by this is they do not try to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. These are not those who are trying to work harder to achieve the things of God. These are not those who lay burdens on other people and say, hey, live this way. But no, when they reflect and they remember the gospel of Jesus Christ, their hearts are melted. Their hearts respond to God. God, thank you that you saved me because I don't deserve it. They stand on the gospel, and when they remember the gospel, it compels them to continue to press on. Who are those who are spiritual? Those who understand the sinful condition. These are not Pharisees or legalists. These are not those who are self-righteous. These are those who have been affected with the gospel and know that the sin in themselves, that they have been saved by grace, and because of the grace that they have received, they're able to look at other brothers and sisters and not look in the sense of of judgmentalism. They're able to embrace them. They're able to come alongside them and be gentle and loving and caring to the person who is caught in sin. Those who are spiritual are also those who hold a proper view of, of God's holiness and know his requirements. Again, just as we were singing that song, How Great Thou Art, when we look at the immensity of who God is, the greatness of of God, of who he is, it should cause our hearts to just bow down. Like Isaiah, when he saw A vision of God, he says, woe is me. I am undone and I dwell amongst people who have unclean lips. He bowed down because of the greatness of who God was. He recognized that God was perfectly holy. Who are those who were spiritual? It is those who keep, or excuse me, those who walk and keep in step with the spirit of God. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse 16. And look at Paul's command. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Holy Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Look at verse 25. He says, if we live by the Spirit... Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Just as I was just talking about transgression or trespass is a false step. Paul may very well be contrasting the two words that you are to keep in step with the Spirit rather than walking falsely, transgressing against the law and the commands of God. Those who are spiritual, these are those who keep in step and walk with the Spirit of God. Thus, these are people who are not trying to work harder. They're simply abiding in the Spirit of God. Now, he goes on. Not only are you who are spiritual to restore uh, such a person, he also tells you how to do it. He says, you are to do it in a spirit of gentleness, Too often, many times, one of the things that keeps us from being a community that wants to be transparent is that we're too harsh. We look look down on people, but we have to look to Jesus. It says about Christ in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 3, a bruised reed he will not crush, and a smoking flax he will not quench. And he says he will bring forth justice for truth. Christ Jesus, our Lord, is gentle. And if you're spiritual, if you're one who has been born of the Spirit, you recognize that you do not deserve anything but the wrath of God. But yet, Jesus, how did he deal with you? He dealt with you in gentleness. He embraced you. He graciously called you and allured you to himself that you would be saved. It's very similar uh, for us that we are also to be gentle for those, with those who have fallen or who are caught in sin. Just as Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 24, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, 
able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Similarly, when we see a brother or a sister in, who was caught in sin, we are to come alongside them in a sense of gentleness. But he goes on. Not only are we to um, come alongside and restore those in gentleness, we're also to restore them in humility. Look with me at verse 2. or Look at, me, look at verse 1, excuse me, this latter half of verse 1. And he says, keep watch on yourself. Some of your Bibles might say looking or watching yourself. The idea is that you are to continually keep your eyes on yourself as well. In other words, you are to be mindful, again, of, this, of the sinful condition. You are not to um, look at people with a sense of haughtiness or look at people um, as if they're beneath you or below you. You are to keep watch on yourself. How are you coming alongside them? Are you being gentle? Are you being caring? Is your motivation for their building up rather than tearing them down? Or is your motivation, I'm simply irritated with this person and I just want to correct them? No, Paul is saying, keep watch on yourself. Watch yourself. How are you coming alongside a brother or sister, again, who is caught in sin? Why are we to keep watch on ourselves? It says right here, lest you too be tempted. Too many times we're so busy looking at other people who are in their sin that we're not looking at ourselves. And because we're not looking at ourselves, because we're not mindful of the sin that is within us, we make ourselves susceptible to sin. And not realizing that, hey, all of us are in the same boat. We have received grace for my Lord. This is important because many times if we have too, if we think too highly of ourselves, we're going to be more likely to fall. And this is exactly what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. He says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We are to watch out how we're coming alongside that brother or sister. Look again, verse 2 now. How are, are we to revitalize? How are we to speak life? How are we to encourage? How are we to build up? He says in verse 2, bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. As a way of analogy, I call this a bodybuilding community. And I know by the looks of some of you guys, especially the men, you guys have worked out. Well, maybe not too many of you have worked out. <laughs> but typically when you're young, you want to put on some mass. You want to put on some muscle. So what you would do is that you would have to put your body in such a place where you're going to have more resistance on the muscles. Because when you are exposing it to more weight, it's going to help you to get stronger. In other words, you need a spotter. So you would get someone, and you say, hey, can you spot me? I'm going to do about eight reps. And you do as many as you can. And once you fatigue out, that spotter is going to help you lift up that weight. Now notice this. Muscles do not grow in the midst of the resistance. Muscles grow when you get the proper rest when you get the nutrients, when your muscles have been exposed to a different or a heavier weight or resistance. You see, when we come alongside a brother or a sister, when we say, you know what, let me help you with that weight, we are providing rest and we're providing the necessary nutrients of the milk of the pure word to help encourage them. And when we give them rest and we come alongside them, we help encourage them in their walk with the Lord. So to bear one another's burdens is to be like that spotter, to come alongside them to help that weight that is struggling. Further now, when we talk about burdens, what burdens are we talking about? Now, the context suggests that these are sinful burdens. This could be sin. 
It could be also that men and women may be enslaved to certain types of sin. And I want to use the word enslave because many times, and even people here would say things like, oh, you're addicted. We have to understand that our sin is not an addiction. We're enslaved to it. Now, if we look at Psalm 103, it does talk about sin and parallels it with a sense of disease. However, because of what Christ has done, if we look at Romans chapter 6, 1 John chapter 3, because of Christ, because we have put our faith in Christ, Christ has delivered us from the power of sin. Thus, we are able to walk with him. Now, that doesn't mean that we will not sin. It does not mean that we will not be caught. It does not mean that we're going to walk perfectly. I'm not saying that. However, because of the Spirit of God, we are able to walk in obedience to the Lord. However, we still have to walk in what we call sanctification. That is, becoming more like Christ. This burden can also be depression resulting from sinful thoughts. Many times I like to ask people who may feel a burden or feel depressed, do you believe in the sovereignty of God? Do you believe that God is completely in control? Do you believe that God has you? And of course, most people who are Christian will say, absolutely, I believe in the sovereignty of God. Well, if you believe in the sovereignty of God, why are you allowing sinful thinking to cause a sense of depression? You see, many times we speak theology, we talk about theology, but we don't necessarily believe theology. Because what I believe will have an effect on the way that I live my life. Now, I'm not trying to condemn any of us here. We're very much like that man who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And it's when we start to recognize, as we're talking about emotions, when we recognize emotions that are a result of sinful thinking, that's when we're able to bring it to God and say, God, help me in this. I want to believe you. And so as Christians, as we're lifting the burden, particularly of someone who is depressed, we encourage them with the word of God. So that way that their thinking would be correct. Another burden that a brother or sister may feel or experience is anxiety. Anxiety, which is closely linked to depression. It says in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. You see, when someone is anxious again, we are to give them a good word to encourage them where they are. Another Heavy burden might be a legalistic mindset. This is um, putting ourselves in a place or yoking ourselves to burdens of men. Many people I've even met in this church have, have come out of churches where it was a legalistic church or a legalistic background. You were said, well, you were told, well, I, to be a Christian, I have to live a certain way. I have to dress a certain way. I can only listen to certain types of music. And they say, well, if you're doing these things and you're righteous, now that's legalism. Coming alongside a brother or a sister in Christ is being able to free them from those burdens of men. Those burdens. Again, there are many types of burdens. Now, what hinders Christians from carrying burdens. One could be isolation. You don't have community. It is amazing to me. Sometimes I can have people who want to meet up for counseling and I ask them, when was the last time you've been to church? Well, I haven't been to church. I've been watching online. What community group are you in? Well, yeah, I haven't been in community. Do you have any accountability in your life? No. And they expect me to fix them. You cannot isolate yourself. It is an oxymoron to say that you're a Christian to stay away from community. This is exactly why we do membership. This is why we have community groups. This is why we're trying to facilitate opportunities for you to have relationships in Christ that you would be able to grow. It can also be pride. Well, I don't need the help of other people. Or it can be the pride of those who need to bear the burden of others, saying, you know what? 
I'm not like Joe. I'm not like Sally. Therefore, I'm not going to come alongside them. And you think you're too good or too great. It can be selfishness, simply just a lack of love, impatience. Well, you know what? I have to watch a basketball game on Wednesday. I'm sorry. I don't have time for you this week. Judgmentalism, rather than coming alongside them and loving and caring for them, you just judge them instead. Again, we are to bear burdens by one, being in community, asking questions. How are you doing spiritually? What was the last thing that you read that is encouraging your walk with the Lord? Listen to people who are going through things. Encourage someone with what you've been learning in Scripture and do this. Pray. This is what we do in our community group. We get together, we talk about the word, we take prayer requests, we find out what things are going, what people are going through, we pray for them, we have telegrams so that way we're informed on how to pray for people. We have to be in community. Christian community is a grace of God and used as a means of grace for the perseverance of the saints. You see, we need the church, and when we all do this, we fulfill the law of Christ. Again, look at verse three, or excuse me, verse two. Bear one another's burdens. Why? So that you would fulfill the law of Christ. Now, when he talks about the law of Christ, it is simply the law of love. John 13, 34, 35, a new commandment I give to you that you what? Love one another. When you love the people in your community, as Christ has loved you, you come alongside them and you help to encourage and you help to build them up. Again, this is not legalism. This is not antinomianism, meaning that this is not without law. You're encouraging them in the ways of God. So we see here that we are to be a revitalizing community. We are to be a community that helps encourage people. And if we think that we're too great, look at verse 3. If anyone thinks he has something when he has nothing, he deceives himself. Church, City Bible Church, we are to be a community of people who help to revitalize. That is to bring life. We are to encourage one another. But this brings me to my second point. Not only are we to be a revitalizing community, secondly, we are to be a reflective Christian. A reflective Christian. Look at verse 4. He says, But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. Take note of the word but. It's a contrast here. Again, it's continuing from the previous statement about not deceiving yourself. And it says here that let each one test his own work. Now, notice here that the work is singular. So now we're going to start to see a transition. So in verses 1 through 3, the two commands like to bear one another's burdens, you all bear one another's burdens. And it says to restore, you all restore one another. But now we're going to a singular. So he says, let a man Test. Now, that's a singular verb, meaning that each one of you. So there's an individual command that you are to reflect. Now, this is important because we have to understand that when we die, we're going to face judgment before God. Now, this is not a judgment or a loss of salvation. It's not that kind of judgment. Basically, everything that we have done before God is going to be tested by fire. For instance, if we were to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 13 to 14, and I'll just read it to you. It says, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Simply, you are responsible before God. In everything that you do before the Lord, there's going to be reward. And if it's not done in a way that is appropriate before the Lord, it says it's going to burn up. Now, you're going to be saved, but the work that you've done, the life that you've lived, is going to be judged before the Lord. But again, this is not 
a judgment on your salvation, like you're going to lose your salvation. It is what you have done for the Lord. And he says here again, let's look at verse 4 again. Each one is to test his own work. Or some of your Bibles will say to examine. You know, like an examination that you have taken. I'm sure many of you have taken a test. You take a test, you pass an exam, or you fail an exam. An exam basically lets you know what you know or what you do not know. So you know that when you take a test, your knowledge will be proven. If you fail the test, you do not know the material. Also know that your knowledge of the test is not predicated on whether your neighbor next to you passed the test. In other words, when you, as you're living your life, God's not going to look and say, well, Joe, your neighbor, well, he failed this test, therefore you failed your test, or he passed this test, therefore you passed your test. No. You are going to be responsible for the work that you have done. Let us consider Peter. Peter in John chapter 21, he says to Jesus while he's looking at John, the apostle, and Peter says, what about this man? And Jesus responds to him and says, what is it to you if he remains until I return? And he looks at Peter and he says, you follow me. Similarly, when we are before the Lord, he simply says, you follow me. But also when we're talking about examining or testing ourselves, we have to also realize that it, it, it implies an external standard, an external standard, and that standard is Christ. You see, when we compare ourselves, we are not to compare ourselves with one another. Rather, we are to bring ourselves to the light of who Christ is, realizing that Christ is the faithful servant of God. In the book of Hebrews, it talks about how Jesus was faithful in all his house, when we think about the standard of Jesus, Jesus is the high priest of God. He is the one who mediates on behalf of sinful men and women like you and I, that we would have a relationship with God. Christ is also fully God. Christ is also fully man. And he incarnated himself, he clothed himself in humanity and lived the life that we could never have lived. When we think about Christ and the standard of Christ, Christ has authority over all life. Jesus says, I lay down my life, meaning that he had died. Not that people took it from him, but he laid it down and he rose up again. Christ, who is also perfectly holy and sinless. Christ sacrificed, who also atones for the sins of the world. This is why we're here today, because of what Christ has done. Christ, who also sits in heaven, who intercedes on behalf of the saints when we don't even know how to pray. Christ is the standard. And so what Paul is saying here is that you don't compare yourself to one another. How do you test yourself? You examine yourself in light of the person of Christ. But there's more. How do we reflect? Here's just some practical Applications. How do we reflect? Stop and pause. Stop and pause. Too often we live lives very busy. Sometimes we leave the house and we don't even reflect on the person of God. Too many times we are not taking the time to even look and analyze, Lord, what's going on in my own heart? Think about the psalmist who says twice a day, Lord, I, I praise you. The psalmist says at midnight I rise to give thanks to you. Joshua was told by God, this book of the law, you should meditate day and night. We are to make a consorted effort before the Lord to spend time with him. Stop and pause. And when you pray, you are to pray like the psalmist, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We're praying and asking the Lord to disclose the things that are in our hearts. Secondly, stop looking at other people's sin. Now, there is a need for us to come alongside, to encourage one another, but too often we're not taking the time to even look at ourselves and say, is there sin in my life? Is there sin in my heart? In other words, take the beam out of your eye first and then remove the speck out of someone else's eye. That way you can see clearly 
how are we to reflect? You are to reflect by using the word of God. Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is living and powerful. And then it goes on. The word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When we look into the word, when we're having a daily dose of the word, it starts to disclose things that are going on within us. If we're taking the time to simply stop, pause, and allow the word of God to do what it does, namely to bring conviction. You can also ask a friend, ask a spouse, hey, is there something in my life that I'm not doing that's living up to the ways of God? And then if you ask that question, don't be so quick to defend yourself, but simply just listen and hear what people have to say and then take it to prayer and ask the Lord, Lord, are these things true? How can I overcome them? Fifth, be specific. Be specific about sin. Put a a Bible verse and say, okay, this is the specific sin and turn from it. I always encourage People also to journal. Write out your prayer. Be as raw and be as transparent as you can. Lord, what particular area of my, of my life am I in sin? And not just the actions, but Lord, what about my thinking? And again, I'm trying to take those thoughts and I'm trying to take the, the actions that I do and I'm trying to bring it under the authority of Christ. And then acknowledge it, confess it, and eighth. Repent while asking for God's strength to overcome what particular area that you are struggling with or that you are in sin with. Let's go back to verse 4. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason of boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. Why are we to test our own work? He says right here. Then his reason of boast will be in himself alone. Now, is Paul saying that we should boast in ourselves? Absolutely not. Rather, it is an understanding of the grace of God that is working in and through us. If you recall, if we were to look at Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, there was a Pharisee. Jesus is telling a parable, and he talks about a Pharisee who's praying. And the Pharisee prays, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. And I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. And he goes on, he says, I fast twice a week. I do all of these great things. Oh God, I'm so great. Essentially, that's what he's saying. Paul is not telling us that we are to boast as if we're good in and of ourselves. It is not us that's great. It is God who is working in us. So when we see a brother and sister in Christ who was caught in sin, we do not judged him or looked down upon them as if we're better than him. Let me read Jonathan Edwards. He talks about um, his attitude, what he wanted his attitude to be when he saw sin in someone else. And Edwards says, resolved to act in all respects, both in speaking and doing, as if nobody had ever been as sinful as I am. And when I encounter sin in others, I will feel, at least in my own mind and heart, as if I had committed the same sins or had the same weaknesses or failings as others. I will use the knowledge of their failings to promote nothing but humility, even shame in myself. I will use awareness of their sinfulness and weakness only as an occasion to confess my own sins and misery to God. Again, it is the grace of God that is working in us. And when we see sin in others, Edwards is saying, I don't want to be proud as if I'm better. Rather, I am going to look as if that sin is upon myself and I want to humble myself. And it's recognition, it is a recognition that it is the grace of God that is working in your life. Now, many of us know that, you know, I'm not as bad as I used to be. I'm not where I should be, but I know that I'm not where I used to be. And so when you recognize the grace, of your, the grace of God in your life, you're able to reflect and say, you know what? I thank God that I'm not where I used to be. But again, it's not a comparing yourself to other people. And this is exactly what Paul is saying again in verse 4. He says, 
But let each one test his work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. Essentially what Paul is saying here, do not compare yourself to your neighbor. Do not compare yourself to your brother. Do not compare yourself to your spouse. Rather, look to Christ. He is the standard. He is the standard. Recognize that simply it is the grace of God that is working in your life. We do not compare ourselves with other Christians. Other Christians are not the standard. Jesus alone is the standard. And Paul goes on in verse 5. And he kind of sums up everything that he's been saying. For each will have to bear his own load. Again, the word bear there is in a singular. It's a singular, like you, individually. He also talks about load. You also notice that that's also a singular verb. And what's also interesting about this word load, it has been used several times in Scripture to talk about um, burdens. So, for instance, if we were to look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 4, Luke chapter 11, verse 46, it talks about how the Pharisees, they were loading bear, or burdens on people. That's the same word in the Greek. But here, it's singular, one load, speaking of your responsibility. Very similar to what Jesus says. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden. It's the same word in Greek, our load is light. Why is it light? Because Jesus enables us by the Spirit of God, but also Jesus has blessed us with community to come alongside one another in order to bear the burdens of one another. Church, this is so important. And I don't want you to think that having a revitalizing community and having a reflective Christian that, that they are at odds with one another, they're not. They work together. And I think an illustration is appropriate. I was thinking of, and I know many of you guys have watched Lord of the Rings on the last episode. And it's Frodo who's been given a task of destroying a ring. And he's on a mountain to throw it in fiery lava. And he's stuck. He can't move anymore. He's just laying there. But a friend comes alongside him, his friend Sam. And he says, Sam, says to Frodo. And he reminds him of the Shire. Frodo, don't you remember the taste of the strawberries? Don't you remember the flowing water? He's reminding him of because of his home because he knows that we're going to go back home. And Frodo responds, I I can't remember the taste of strawberries. I, I can't remember the sound of the flowing water. And Frodo, or excuse me, Sam looks at Frodo and he says, come on, I cannot carry your burden, but I can carry you. And so he picks up his friend, puts him on his shoulder, and he walks him up just enough so that way Frodo was able to destroy the ring. You see, many of us, similarly, we have our responsibility before God. But as a community, as the church, we are to come alongside one another to bear and to carry the burdens that we have in order to fulfill the race that God has for us. Church, we need each other. We need to be in community. And we need each other to help build one another up. So we are to, again, revitalize one another, but at the same time, we need to reflect on our walk before the Lord. Church, let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you again for this time. And God, I do pray that we would have such a love for your truth and a love for your people because, God, you've done it all. God, help us to bear the burdens of one another. Help us, God, to come alongside one another. But, Lord, also help us to reflect on our own walk before you. God, that, one, we would be humble, that we would be patient, that we would be gentle along other brothers and sisters, Lord. We give you glory. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we conclude.
but yet not I, but through Christ in me. Thank you.